questions because there's just so much to know about. Because what we're learning about intermittent fasting, folks, is that this is one of the hacks that we can do that gets really quick results. It's great for weight loss. It's great for anti-aging. It's great for mood. It's great for prevention of many things. Mm -hmm. And it's great for just really finding that inner peace. And there's so many reasons why. So Cynthia, let's start out. I mean, you know, you're an entrepreneur. You've done so many things. And we've talked about all the things that you've done before. You know, your podcast, the host of the Everyday Wellness Podcast. And you, know, you have done so many things that have just blown up this whole idea. So let's start by talking about what the heck is intermittent fasting and uh, why do you call it the magic bullet? Well, I would say that intermittent fasting is really the way that our bodies are designed to thrive. You know, if we look at ancestral health patterns and we really examine the way that our bodies are designed to thrive, it, we're designed to not eat constantly and we're not designed to snack and have many meals. We are designed to eat a meal, spend time digesting the meal and fast in between. And so, you know, from many perspectives, you know, this fasting is part of a lot of ritual, ritualistic um, holidays and, and part of many, many religions, you know, back to biblical times. And so I feel like it's a lost art. I think it's uh, something that has really started to gain tremendous momentum as people are realizing that, realizing that a lot of the dogma as it pertains to health, quote unquote, healthy eating or healthy snacking or mini meals is really not working. You know, we have a, a population that is getting increasingly obese and sick and diseased, and people are really looking for strategies that they themselves can have some control over and things that they can be flexible with. And I believe it's the magic bullet because most, if not all adults can really integrate this in some form or fashion into their lives. And I, I think that I've been really outspoken, you know, calling out people that are still shaming people into counting every calorie and over exercising and not really taking care of ourselves. I, I think that you know, one of the things that has really become apparent to me after 20 plus years of being in healthcare is that what we're doing with our patients is not working. And so we need to find ways for them to be able to sustain their health throughout their lifetime and do it in a way that's not gimmicks. I'm so tired of the potions and pills and powders and nonsense that I see that propagated every, you know, every new year, there's some new gimmick, there's some new concept. And so I think that really does a disservice to adults, you know, men and women, but especially women, because we're special. You know, we, we have hormones that regulate you know, nearly every aspect of our lives. And so it makes things a little more complicated for us. And I find it innately frustrating that there's so much shaming going on. We're expect to be in a box, you know, we're supposed to look a certain way and be a certain size and all these, all this pressure and yet that's not realistic for the average individual. And so I want to be able to harness strategies that people can biohack away with and utilize uh, you know, to, their, to their benefit and not make it complicated. I'm so tired of things being overcomplicated. I think that it's funny what you said about the shaming because we mm -hmm. also have to think about so many different things. And it's interesting you talk about ancestral mm -hmm. nutrition and medicine because that's really the vein in which I came mm -hmm. from. And which is why I discovered this, you know, the, the bone broth and how, we, why we should put it on everyone's plate and, and why I felt like it was so important just for the reasons that you just mentioned. Yeah. So when we think about this, we are, we all have a shape and a build that really has to do with our, our heritage and where mm -hmm. we're from and who we are as people. You know, mm -hmm. I'm never going to be Cynthia, a beanpole, never. I'm always going to be voluptuous. I'm always going to have a big backside. I'm always going to have, you know, this is how I'm built. So what I love about intermittent fasting is I feel like it tweaks you in the way you need to be tweaked. Correct. It really does. And th there's so many benefits. And one of them is this whole premise of anti-aging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all want to get in on that. So how does intermittent fasting help mm -hmm. you with aging? Yeah. So, you know, one of the key benefits, it's one of the nerdy science benefits is this term called autophagy. And so, you know, it's a twofold thing. We recycle up diseased and disordered cells that we don't need, 
But we also, one of the, the key aspects of intermittent fasting is we're keeping insulin levels low. And so when insulin levels are low in the body, it lessens our likelihood of dealing with uh, metabolic disease, diabetes, uh, neurologic diseases. And so I like to remind people that, you know, metabolic flexibility is the key. We want to be able to keep our insulin levels low. We want to be able to boost growth, human growth hormone. We know with longer fasts, we get more autophagy, more boosting of human growth hormone. And there are a lot of ways that we can do that. But one of the key ways that we can do that is, is with the strategy of intermittent fasting. And I will say for anyone, as I'm getting closer to 50 and no longer 40, uh, I want to do everything I can to continue to be active, mobile. Um, I have a, an all boy household, as I like to remind people, I want to keep up with my kids for as long as I can. Um, and that's, that's a key aspect of this is that, you know, there, there are all these really cool benefits that people like to focus on the weight loss piece, but I remind them there's so much more. It's just scratching the surface. There's so many other benefits that we sometimes don't, we don't remember. And it's so funny that you said that about, you know, I'm just approaching 50 and I went, here's the thing, every decade, I feel like it takes us a little while to settle in. So if you're just mm -hmm. 40, there's principles that need to change and there's mm -hmm. things that you need to know. And most people settle in, you know, 42, 43, they finally have settled into that decade. And it's the same thing with the 50s and, and, and beyond. And one of the things I love about intermittent fasting is I feel like, you know, that 38 to 40 and beyond when you're trying to push through where it's not as easy anymore. Yeah. And then for, the, for some people that say, well, I'm you know, 30 and it's, it's tough for me and I've just had a baby and all of these things. It's such a natural way to harness your body, uh, your body's power. Mm -hmm. uh, your power to do all the things that you want to do. You talked about metabolism. Mm -hmm. You talked about regulating insulin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if it's, it, it's uh, people really understand how, how important it is just to regulate blood sugar. Oh. Just regulating blood sugar alone makes you bionic. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it is the first thing I work on with every single patient without doubt. And, and it's, I think a lot of it is propagated by, we were told to eat frequently. We were told to stoke our metabolism. We were told to have snacks. You know, I remember I used to go to the hospital. I would go to the gym. I'd have a shake before. I'd have a shake after. I'd eat something small before I started seeing patients. I'd eat in the morning. I'd eat lunch. I mean, I think about how often I was releasing insulin in response to food. And it was probably fine until I hit perimenopause, the five to seven years preceding menopause. And then it's like I hit a wall. Like I had never struggled with my weight. I had never had problems sleeping. And all of a sudden it was like the, the playing field got leveled. I was like, okay, it's a new game. I got to figure this out. And so I remind women all the time. I'm like, listen, you got to figure out the new game. Maybe at every decade, like you mentioned, every decade, we got to shake things up a little bit. I believe you know, we grieve, perhaps we grieve a little bit of what we were able to get away with before that now we can't. Um, but then you look at it as you're like, I have all these other wonderful things. I have this wisdom. I have this confidence. I have you know, I have stamina that I never thought was possible. Okay, you um, just said something that is so important. And, you know, we talk about the brave aspects of aging and such. Mm -hmm. And I want everyone to hear what Cynthia just said. There's so many benefits and there's so much beauty and elegance to getting older. And you really do have a, a different assertion of life and you feel a different confidence in life. Mm -hmm. So if we could just balance that with what our body is able to do. And if our body is able to kind of lean into the same kind of beauty that we feel in all other areas of our life, as we really reach that uh, higher level of consciousness, as, as we get older, it's a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do, you know, really harness the beauty and the power of the body with this wisdom that mm -hmm. we end up generating as we get older. Yeah. And so one of the things that, uh, that, intermittent fasting does it really teaches us about ketones and how to use ketones for energy so talk about how yeah. this happens and a lot of people don't really know what ketones are so explain mm -hmm. that a little bit Cynthia. yeah so you know one of the things that you're really advocating for when you're doing intermittent fasting is is going from using primarily glucose as your primary fuel source to using fats or ketone bodies and so we know that ketone bodies are very fuel efficient our brains are very very receptive to using this as a source of fuel. That's why when you're intermittent fasting and you're fat adapted, you have so much mental clarity versus someone that's using sugar as their primary fuel source. 
they get hangry, they have trouble get, they have trouble losing weight, um, they get energy fluctuations with some frequency. You know, they're the people that are craving carbs because their body's looking for a quick source of energy. And so when you're fat adapted and you're using ketones, you know, your blood sugar is much more stable. And so we talked about that as being foundational to our health, that ensuring we've got well-regulated blood sugar, that we're metabolically stable. And so once you are able to harness managing your blood sugar in a very optimal way, when you're fat adapted, when you're using fat as that primary fuel source, um, your, your hormones are better balanced. And let's be clear, the 40s and 50s really is um, I'm, I'm not going to call it the, the, the shit show, but yeah, maybe I will. It really is this, <laughs> should. sorry, I was like holding up. I was like thinking if my mother's watching this, it's still, it's those Catholic girl things from years ago. It's like my mother will be so upset. But the point is, is that we want to keep those hormones supported. And you look at the hierarchy of hormones and we know that insulin and cortisol are so close, are so closely interdependent that if our blood sugar is not properly regulated, everything else is impacted, our sleep quality, our food cravings, um, underlying food sensitivities, you know, weight gain or weight loss. And so it all starts with those foundational concepts. And so when we talk about being fat adapted, using ketones as a fuel source, it really is a really important principle. And it's also the freedom that you get with intermittent fasting. It may not happen immediately. For some people, it could take two, four, six, eight weeks to get there. But when you do get there, that's the freedom. That's the, oh, I forgot to eat today because I was I had a very busy morning and all of a sudden it's two o'clock in the afternoon. And that's the beauty of being able to tap into this, you know, much more fuel efficient way of, um, you know, feeding your body as opposed to sugar where you get, you get an hour or two and then you feel like you run out of gas. You're tired, you're hangry, you're grumpy. No one wants to be around you when you're like that. And you think about little kids, you know, sometimes that's why they get cranky when they get hungry. And I always say like, I can understand a child, but as adults, we don't want that way. We don't want our, you know, our health to be driven by the desire to use a very inefficient type of gas in the tank, if you will. So ketones are freedom. That's, I always say ketones equal freedom. And this is why our brains really appreciate them better. It's a much more fuel efficient way to power our bodies forward and the really cool thing is once you've you've made that transition there is so much freedom in that it's really a beautiful thing and we're going to talk about as we progress on with this conversation mm -hmm. uh, if it's difficult to get into mm -hmm. uh if it's, if it's different if it's difficult for your body to push into mm -hmm. burning ketones mm -hmm. So we'll, and we'll talk about that as we go along. And by the way, this is a free forum. I see a lot of you are asking questions and understand that we will take some questions at the end. So if you have some questions as we're having this discussion, please feel free to write them and we will do our best to answer them. We have our producer, Stacy on who is monitoring Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you have questions, please write them. They will get to us. And those of you on Zoom, we're getting your questions. So let's talk a little bit about autophagy. Mm -hmm. And what is this? I mean, I, this was a new term. Nobody had heard of this. And all of a sudden, about two years ago, we started hearing more about this. And that tells me that there's some value because it hasn't gone away. So talk to us about what, what is autophagy and why is it so important? Yeah, it's the spring cleaning of the cells. And, and that only occurs when we're in a fasted state. So when you're eating, it turns off. There's another mechanism called mTOR that gets activated. And it's all about balance. But you have to understand that most people are eating 16 or 17 times a day, either with sugar-sweetened beverages or with food. So there's very little autophagy that's going on. And when we scavenge up this you know, garbage or these diseased and disordered cells, we're getting rid of things that could be precancerous. We are getting rid of you know, junk that we don't need. I always say it's all about efficiency. It's a way to ride the body in a very efficient manner. And so we recognize that there are specific things that can enhance this. And one of them is this process of fasting. And so you know, if you talk to different experts, if you're looking at research, um, there are always benefits to going longer periods without eating, but really things get turned up in the 18 to 24 hour fasted time frame. And so, you know, there's, there's always the question, is there value in doing a shorter fast? Absolutely. There's always benefits. But if you're really interested in the autophagy aspect, 18 to 24 hour mark is where, where things really ramp up. And so I always encourage people, you want to be doing, uh, you know, once you're fat adapted, of course, once the, the training wheels are off the bike and you can, you know, ride on your own, you want to be doing some periods of even 24, 36, 48 hour fasts a few times throughout the year because that's just a better waste and recycling process. Uh, much like the glymphatic system 
in the brain that goes on when we sleep, when we get high quality sleep, really, really important that our body is able to tap into this process. And I believe that there was a scientist, it was 2016, when you know he actually did the research in this area, of course, in a lab, but um, a lot of the information can be extrapolated to humans. And so I always mention to people that, you know, that 18 to 24 hours is really the, the sweet spot when things start to accelerate. You can, you know, watch and trend data. You like to do that. Um, really important for, you know, looking at, you know, prognostic indicators and all the benefits that you get out of it. You know, this is really mind blowing in, in many ways because we were always taught, you know, make sure you eat breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, we, if we want to talk about all the things that we've been told over the years about sugar, you know, about fat, uh, about whole grains, and it just keeps going on and on and on. And again, it goes back to you know, being able to balance your, your, your sugar and being able to have the metabolism kick in and do all of the best things that, that it can for you. And one of the things that we always hear is don't fast. Make sure you eat your breakfast, eat those small meals because your metabolism will shut down. So don't listen to any of these people out there that are talking about fasting because you are sure to have your metabolism. It's going to shut down and you're going to get, you're going to get even more heavy than you were. Right. 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 And I think, you know, those kinds of dogmas, uh, I always say I, I was trained, you know, where I went to school, we were trained to not be sheep. And so I started calling BS when I started to recognize, you know, I'm working in cardiology and I'm so frustrated because people are looking for pills, but we've misguided our patients. We've convinced our patients that a pill is the solution when really what the solution is, is actually doing the hard work, changing your diet, prioritizing sleep, changing how frequently you eat. But yes, thinking about all those dogmas, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Many meals and snacks are absolutely, I mean, how many times did we go out and I would have snacks in my bag because I'd been conditioned to believe that, oh my gosh, I can't go more than two or three hours without eating. And I laugh, I, I, I dispel all this antiquated dogma. I'm like, really who benefits from uh, keeping us sugar addicted and processed food addicted is the processed food industry. And so I, I grew up like that, and so did you. And we had all the, you know, even the think about the hundred calorie snack packs. We, oh, we, <laughs> snack wells. We get the gold, you know. Mm. Oh my gosh, we can eat these snacks, and they're hundred calories, or we can eat this popcorn, and it's only thirty-five calories. Mm -hmm. So how do you respond to someone when they say, "Oh, come on, it's only thirty-five calories"? That's a pattern interruption, though, is it not, Cynthia? Yes. That's, that, that's that's a shunt, and it shuts things down. It really does. It really does. And, and when I start, and so when I'm, when I'm talking to, to my female patients and I'm talking about restructuring their meals and they're like, but what about the snacks? So the first thing you need to do are cut up snacks. And then the next thing we focus on is replating our meals. So we're focused on protein and healthy fats. And what about the carbs? I'm like, you don't need carbs. What do you mean? I don't need carbs. I've been conditioned to believe I need carbs. And I said, we are a very carb centric uh, uh, culture that we're convinced that we have to have starchy carbs all the time. We need grains, we need gluten, we need all these things. I'm like, listen, your body can make carbohydrates from protein. It's called gluconeogenesis. And when we start talking about the, the science. There's a pathway that all yes. body chemists and chemists, they can tell you about. And this is what, this is so beautiful to hear. And I don't mean to interrupt. I just get really no. excited when I talk to people who so get this and understand this. Mm -hmm. So Cynthia, I'm going off topic a little bit and going off chart in terms of what we talked about, we were going to discuss, but to explain why we don't need whole grains. People think that, and I'm telling you, my business has been uh, listening to the indoctrination of people uh, mm -hmm. being told how to eat and what to eat. And I look at them and I look at the empirical data in front of me that is you know, related to that patient sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, where have we gone off balance here? Where have we gone off, off the chart? Because what I'm seeing on, on my results are not matching what's happening with this person. Right. They're, they're not matching. Because right. I'm seeing somebody who is setting themselves up for diabetes. They're setting themselves up for autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. And I can go on and on, not to mention the fact that they're overweight and they're struggling mm -hmm. and all of these things. So, I mean, how do we, how do we explain to people that you know, you really need so little carbs. Mm -hmm. And when is it that people get to that point that they say, okay, I'm comfortable, I'm settling into this. When does in the white knuckling end? And from all the people that you've worked with, how long is it before they say, okay, I'm settled in now. Now I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm on my game. 
Yeah, well, I think they have to get to a point where they're fed up. You know, either they've been told that they're insulin resistant or that they're diabetic or that, you know, they're a family member gets ill and then they say to themselves, I don't want that for myself. I don't want to live that way. So usually there has to have been some type of health insult of something. And it could have even been one of their children. Maybe their child got sick and then it's the wake up call. They want to, they want to be around and be vibrant. And so I find that for a lot of people, once they have had, you know, whatever this insult has been, uh, to their, you know, personal, you know, their personal life or their professional life, all of a sudden then they take things much more seriously, but it's painful. You know, there are a lot of, you know, what we're dealing with is food addiction. And, you know, a, a lot of people are using food as a source of comfort. They're not feeling their feelings because instead of feeling their feelings, they're eating a bunch of ice cream or they're eating cake or they're having they're not protein bars, they're carbohydrate, carbohydrate bars. <laughs> you know, I tell people that's not, that's not a protein bar, that's a carbohydrate bar. Or they're, you know, downing themselves in, you know, a, a mashed potato pie or something else. So they're, they're using these carbohydrates because they're trying to boost their serotonin levels. So yeah. some of it's also in conjunction with a clinical psychologist where I'm saying, you know, from that, we need a, a clinical health psychologist to be dealing with some of the emotional issues that you're now experiencing, which are painful. And then we're going to slowly start to, to dial back, be open-minded. I always say, let's be open-minded to the process. And that process could be, let's replate our meals. We're going to focus on protein because protein is most satiating and most, if not all women are not eat, consuming enough protein. And, and wonderful Dab uh, Gabrielle Lyon uh, is one of those people that is, is really at, advocating for muscle-centric medicine and how, how <laughs> muscle... Right. And so muscle is the organ of longevity. I'm really, really speaking her language right now. We know we have estrogen receptors on our muscle. And I remind people, you got to lift weights. Doesn't have to be big weights, big weight. You got to eat enough protein, got to do the strength training and then adding in some healthy fats. And I remind people, you want to burn the fat in your body as opposed to eating lots and lots of copious fat. So instead of having two avocado, I'm saying to have half an avocado and burn some fat in your body. And when you start plating your meals that way, people are satiated their blood sugar is so much better supported, they're sleeping better, their mood is better. And then they're amazed, they're like, fat tastes so good, as does protein. Why have I been focused on the carbohydrates? Because that's what the USDA has been ramming down all of our throats as healthcare providers. And you know, when we talk about grains, and I wanna make sure that everyone that's watching hears this, it's, it's not as much the grains, but what's been done to them. So glyphosate, this chemical, this terrible chemical by Monsanto that, so imagine that our intestinal lining, it punches hole, this chemical, you know, can destroy the intestinal lining. We have rampant, um, you know, uh, incidents of autoimmunity. We have all these people getting sick. Uh, we know that, you know, most of these grains, if they haven't been sprayed with glyphosate, they're, they're very carb dependent. They, they are very, they're very dissimilar from what the ancestral grain patterns might have looked like. You know, they've been designed to be anti-mold. They can sit in a silo for long periods of time, or we're exposed to grains because the conventionally raised cattle and meat that we're eating is consuming these things, even though most of these animals would not otherwise consume grains, they'd be consuming grass or insects or other things. And so it's the most unnatural soup with which we are consuming. And, you know, the carbohydrate piece is really problematic. You know, it's, it's, you know, anything that's heavily subsidized by the federal government, you think about corn, you think about wheat, you think about soy, there's a proliferation of it in the processed food industry. And so we are just exposed to all these things on every level at, at all the time. And it's, it's a huge issue, a huge, huge issue. But how do I get people back to your original question? How do I get people to be open-minded to trying I usually try to appeal to their sense of reason. It's like, try this for a week or two, cut out the snacks, focus on protein and healthy fats, come back to me in a week, tell me how you feel. Now, if they don't go too low carb and then they're feeling keto flu, generally they'll say to me, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. And you know, they start seeing some weight loss and then that kind of spurns that desire to continue. And, and it may be that you don't start off with intermittent fasting. Maybe you have to clean up the diet first and then slowly dip the toe into the pond. But I find that once people start feeling better and once they, you know, if they have a buddy, I always say if you have a buddy, a spouse, a significant yeah. other, buddy, you know, a girlfriend, a you know, loved one, do it together and support one another because really so much of this is a sisterhood, a brotherhood. Let's support one another so that we can make these changes because what we are doing right now, 
as a nation is not sustainable. It is so not sustainable. You know, I was reading the other day that the statistics they expect by like 2030 that the average uh, American woman over over 60% of the population is going to be obese. And that's, you know, we're at about 50 now. It's just going to continue to escalate. So we need to change the patterns that we're doing right now. Reprogram, not only just reprogramming ourselves, but reprogramming our children. Like my, my boys think I'm ridiculous. They're very active. Normally they're playing multiple sports. Right now, dealing with COVID and social distancing, not as much. But I'll tell them, I'm like, they're making a big bowl of pasta. I'm like, listen, where's the protein? Where's the fat? And so next thing I know, they pull out, you know, grass-fed steak or they're pulling out bison or something else. And they know, I'm like... That's what you need because otherwise it's this massive insulin spike in response to all those carbs. It spikes really high. And then, you know, sometimes it takes a while to come back down. And I said, that's not a healthy way to fuel your body. So. And I think that's one of the best things that you can just teach your kids. And you know, a lot of us really don't take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. What is a protein? What is a carb? What is a fat? Go through the macros mm -hmm. with your children. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that we really miss. And before your kids go off to college or they go out of the house and on their own, it's really important that they know that. I say the two things that kids have to know, they ask all the time, you know, how can I teach my kids to eat well? Teach them how to have a connection between the food they eat and how it makes them feel. And the second thing is explain to them the macros, just like you do. Where's the fat? Where's the protein? These are important questions. And you know, I love that what you're really saying about understanding this whole idea behind lifting weights or some kind of resistance and protein. You know, I, again, you know, we talked about Gabrielle and I have to say after I had her on and I was taking long walks during COVID, I actually right. talked a lot about this. I said, my gym's closed down. Mm -hmm. I can't get weights. You know, they, they can't deliver them till you know, mid August. This was back in May or you know, April. What am I going to do? I have to tell you what uh, my body tanked and I want everyone to really hear that. When I stopped following what I know our body and our biology, particularly as women are craving, my body tanked. Just taking walks and not being really, um, really uh, cognizant of what I was eating in terms of protein and building the plate and all that, it just, it takes a very short period of time. Don't yeah. you agree? It takes a very short period of time and when I started lifting again and I started you know, walking at, on top of the lifting, everything changed. I started really paying attention to protein. So I want, just kind of want to wake everyone up in terms of that. If you're not eating enough protein, understand how much protein you need. Start doing some resistance. It makes a big difference. Add some intermittent fasting on there. That'll all help. What about human growth hormone, Cynthia? Because that really is the fountain of youth, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about, about that and how intermittent fasting can help? Yeah, so we know, so there's a couple things. When you're intermittent fasting, you want to make sure that you are getting adequate sleep. I always say like there are specific indicators with women in intermittent fasting, one of which is high quality sleep. So seven, eight hours, cold, dark room. If you're not sleeping through the night, don't add in intermittent fasting. It's not going to help. You need to deal with that first. But during sleep, in addition to the glymphatic system, which is like the waste and recycling process going on in our brains, which requires so much energy, it can only occur at night. We also get our largest spike in human growth hormone during the day. So it is absolutely positively critical without question. If you are north of 40 and you are cheating yourself and telling me you're Martha Stewart and you only need three hours of sleep a night, you are, you know, you probably also believe in, in the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy and a bunch of other factitious, you know, facetious kinds of concepts. But the other piece is, you know, when we know that the 18 to 24 hour mark of fasting, you get this spike in human growth hormone and that continues for a period of time. That is why sleep and fasting, but you got to make sure you got the sleep ratcheted in first, but then the fasting, the extended fasting piece is so, so important. I myself, and I tell people this very openly, I do one 24-hour fast a week without fail because I am a big believer. I mean, I, I've hit this milestone in my life. I, I didn't expect to go into menopause in my 40s, but I had a healthcare hiccup last year and lost a lot of weight uh, because I had been so sick in the hospital, and that threw my body into early menopause. And so one of the things that's really important for me now that I'm no longer cycling is that I'm really, really... Um, really good about the sleep piece because that's absolutely critical because when you don't get enough sleep, you don't crave broccoli, you crave junk. Um, and then also making sure that I'm doing one 24 hour fast a week because then I'm going to get more secretion of human growth hormone, which 
if you look at the average American, average westernized person, as they're aging, they're getting lower level of sex hormones are also getting low, lower levels of human growth hormone. And so we know that that can be very, very instrumental in skeletal muscle hypertrophy. So being able to build lean muscle and, you know, even I'm starting to see my body shift and change over the last year and a half. And I'm okay with that, but recognizing that we really want to harness these properties, these hormones that we can really benefit from tapping into um, by utilizing the strategy, but don't forget the sleep. That is by far foundational. If you don't have that ratcheted in, you got to ratchet that in first. Yeah, that's great advice. And one of the things that you said that I loved the last time we spoke was you said that I keep my room at 65 degrees. I do. <laughs> and you know what? The, the, the darkness of the room, the temperature, all of that matters. And what you said was incredibly important for people mm -hmm. to know. Sleep first, guys, because when yep. you don't get sleep, you start craving sugar and salt. Yep. That's what you start craving. Yeah. So you got to get that. You got to get that really locked down. What about all of the people out there, Cynthia, who say, you know what? And I know we're getting a lot of questions, and I'm going to start getting to those. A lot of people say, you know, I can't try fasting because, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get too tired and hungry. Or I try fasting, and I, you know, it's going to make me tired, hungry, or maybe tired, hungry. Uh, how do you address that with people? How do you get them through that? Um, well, those are limiting beliefs. So I always kind of call people out on that. And I said, okay, that's a limiting belief. I'm not sure if you even recognize that's what that is. So maybe what we need to do is commit to 12 hours a day of fasting, which really isn't fasting per se, but at least then you're going from maybe 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then you're going to have a, a coffee, you know, afterwards, but really kind of sitting down with someone and what are your concerns? What are your fears? And sometimes just sitting down with someone and hearing their concerns, validating their concerns, you know, objectively providing information that allows them to understand that they're, they're going to be in a very supported environment where they're going to have resources. Um, and I always say slow and steady, you know, your best friend may be able to go from zero to 60. She can go from 12 hours fast to 16 effortlessly like a duck to water. That doesn't mean that's your, going to be your experience, but it also doesn't mean that hers is any less important than yours because yours needs to be done a little more slowly. I find the more carb addicted people are, the longer it takes them to get fat adapted, the longer it takes them to get to a point where they have energy and they feel good. But here's the other thing. Sometimes intermittent fasting is not right at the time. It doesn't mean that it's not right in the future. I can tell you when I lost 15 pounds in the hospital, I didn't intermittent fast for a while. I couldn't, I couldn't even lift or do much of anything. So I like to remind people, I took a, a period of time off because that's what my body needed. And then when I was ready to start doing it again, I did absolutely fine. So there's no shame in saying now's not the right time. I need to deal with my sleep piece yeah. first. And let me just touch on the one sleep statistic I think is really important. We know that if you get less than six hours a night of sleep, your ability to control your blood sugar, remember we talked about blood sugar earlier, is reduced by 60%. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have, I don't want to be insulin resistant. So dialing in on that sleep, that's like the A number one priority. When you're thinking about sleep, it's if I'm not sleeping through the night, let's figure out why. That's the most important thing to figure out first. I agree. It's just for me, it's sleep and you know hydrating. Yep. Those are the two pieces that people are really lacking. They're so easy to fix. Mm -hmm. They're so when you're intentional about it, they're easy to fix. <laughs> That's okay. It's all friendly around here. <laughs> so let's talk about intermittent fasting. You say that uh, that it's like training a muscle. So what's the best way to start? Let's talk about the way to start mm -hmm. and the different ways to fast. We are down to the last 20 minutes and I want to make sure you some questions. So yeah. let's talk about how do we start this whole thing? I would say, you know, the easiest way, if you're eating a standard American diet, three meals, many meals, snacks in between, cut out the snacks. So that's number one, cut out the snacks and start being cognizant of how much carbohydrates you're eating. It may not be that you're measuring them or that you're recording them, but I'd say those are the first two things. And then you need to ask yourself, are you sleeping through the night? If you are, great, you can proceed. If you're not, then you need to go back and deal with that. Um, usually there, there's a week or two of that, and then we slowly start edging into, okay, you had dinner at 6 p.m., you're not going to have breakfast until 8 a.m., and people are surprised that they can count the time, the amount of time they're sleeping towards their fasting window, so I remind them, you know, you've already probably done 14 hours without even trying, and yeah. so we do 
14 hours checking in, making it very clear what they can consume while they are fasted because there, there's dirty fasting and clean fasting. And I'm very, very specific about clean fasting is the only way, no crutches allowed because that, that tends to lend itself to bad habits. So during that fasting window, like when you get up in the morning, you can have green tea, bitter teas, black tea, or plain coffee. And if you don't like plain coffee, you can shake some salt in it. Honest to goodness, I, I'm told that that changes the whole flavor, flavor profile in a way that makes it a little less bitter. So coffee, you can add a little bit of salt. So I guess a, a good salt, so you get some minerals, like a kelp. Yeah. Himalayan sea of salt, absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then I would say, you know, maybe you break your fast at eight a.m. and it's and you break your fast with some protein and some fats. You're not going to have a Lego waffle. You're not going to have cereal. The days are gone of sugar. Like really, what what a Lego waffle should be and a muffin and an English muffin and bread is just dessert. So just think about it that way. I don't have dessert for breakfast. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You want to make sure you break your fast with a fermented food or you want to have it with light protein and maybe a little bit of, of uh, fat. And then slowly, it, it, depending on the person, because some people uh, will find that you know they, they do really well. They go from 14 hours to 15 hours over a couple days or week up to 16. And I would say 16 is, you know we kind of stop and reevaluate. How do you feel at 16 hours? Are you sleeping well? How is your cognition? How is your energy? Uh, people are very fearful. They think that they're just going to die without food. And I remind them, I think when they finally get to that point, it's like climbing a mountain. They feel invincible. They're like, this is fantastic. I want to do more. And so I remind them that, that the, the happy point when they first start out, again, we're, it, we're putting on the training wheels. So we want them to be consistent. We definitely want them to ascertain, could they go a little longer? Maybe they can go to 17 hours. But if they go to 18 and then they have, they have a massive binge because they're so overly hungry, I'm like, take it step back a notch, go back to 16 hours. And so the process of slowly opening up that, that fasting window could take six to eight weeks and that is totally okay. And then once they have mastered intermittent fasting, they're sleeping, again, sleeping well, they have lots of energy, they're mentally clear, um, they're making good food choices. Then I feel like they get to this sweet spot where they're all of a sudden, they're like, you know what, I don't wanna eat the junk because I don't feel good when I do that. I don't want to binge because I don't feel good because it dysregulates my blood sugar. People will oftentimes drink a whole lot less alcohol. They don't want the desserts. They recognize protein bars as being carbohydrate bars. Um, and just reminding them every step as they're going along that, you know, the, e the best and easiest way to get into ketosis or be fat adapted faster is to consume less carbohydrates. So carbohydrates from green vegetables, low glycemic berries, occasionally having things like squash or root vegetables or sweet potatoes. But really, if you're a woman north of 40, I find that most women are don't necessarily do well with gluten, grains, and dairy. And, and I, I get a lot of hate mail about this, but I want to be very clear. You know, you have to decide for yourself, what do you want more? Do you want to be feeling um, energetic and sexy and vibrant? Or do you want to feel like you're the sad sack on the couch and feeling sad and depressed because you're, you're not eating foods that are creating, you know, food and mood go so closely together. You're not creating healthy neurotransmitters because you're eating a lot of sugary junk. Um, you know, you, you're fueling this anxiety and depression. And I see a lot of anxiety and depression that is fueled by gluten and, and dairy as, as just two examples. Obviously everyone's an individual, but I'm at a point in my life where gluten and dairy are not my friend. And I've completely broken up with them and I'm happy about it. Um, so that's kind of a, a basic overview of how I would walk someone through that, but addressing limiting beliefs as they come up, because they can really derail people. I find people's inner dialogue with themselves can really be their best friend or their worst enemy. And I had to learn that I had a lot of limiting beliefs just in life in general, not even just with food and diet and nutrition and wellness and wholeness. I had a lot of limiting beliefs. It's something again, that you have to be really aware of and be intentional about really coming to some kind of resolve with because mm -hmm. it can sabotage you in many areas of your life. So one of the things that you talked about was we're breaking the fast with fermented food, protein, and fat. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's the yeah. Best. Typically we don't want it to be carbs because we don't want to spike. So here's one of the things. So insulin is that, is that key hormone that helps our body. You know, we eat food, you know, our blood glucose goes up. It helps move the glucose into the cell. We don't want to have these massive spikes of it. We want the insulin to go up and come down. We don't want it to stay prolonged. And you think about it, how, how do you feel when you eat a bowl of rice or a big bowl of pasta or a ton of bread? 
first of all, it's very hard to stop eating it, right? It's very hard to limit ourselves because we just, you know, you get enough insulin going that, you know, it makes it very, it, it's very, it's very challenging just to eat a little bit. Whereas protein fills you up, fat will fill you up. Um, I, I just find that, you know, the focus needs to be on the protein and the fat, less on the carbs, very small portion of carbs. I always say, I'm not anti-carb. I just want people to be smart about their carbs. And it's portion sizes and choices are really critical. How do we navigate through exercising through mm -hmm. fasting? Well, um, well, I would say that I like to do things that I know boost the benefits of intermittent fasting or just boost some of the shared benefits. So I like to do HIT. I don't do prolonged cardio. I do walk in my neighborhood because I just enjoy that, but I'm not doing that for, you know, cardio. Um, I, I'm like, I want to be efficient. I want to get my, my HIT done, high intensity interval training or Tabata training, short and sweet, you know, 20 minutes done. I'm breathy. I'm sweaty. I'm thrilled. Um, and I like to lift. So from my perspective, once you're fat adapted, you should be able to effortlessly work out. I know we have this kind of limiting belief that goes that we have to eat before we exercise and we have to have protein immediately within 30 minutes after exercise, which I'm convinced was probably told to, taught to us by a fit pro who probably didn't have any science behind it. No offense to a lot of the fit pro friends I have. I'm just trying to think where that might've come from. But, you know, we have all these limiting beliefs that we have to eat a certain way around this, you know, this exercise patterning but when you're tapping into, um, into fat stores for energy to keep your blood sugar sustained, you don't have to eat when you exercise. In fact, I used to before COVID, I would get up at you know, five or six o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, lift, come home, get my kids to school, and then start my work day. And so really finding what works best for you. Now, not everyone wants to do a hit, but I think it's really important that you're doing things to stress the body in little micro increments because we know that will actually help you know secrete more human growth hormone we know that you know the, those we want to get breathy we want to be metabolically flexible we don't want to be a couch potato we absolutely positively and if you have joint problems then get on uh, an elliptical or get in a pool and walk or you know do things that that don't hurt your body but what i find is when people start changing their nutrition patterns and they start losing some weight the joint issues get better I mean, I had a woman who needed a joint replacement and she kept saying to her orthopedist, I don't want a joint replacement. And so he said, then lose weight. And so that was the impetus for doing intermittent fasting and changing your diet. And now she doesn't need a joint replacement. And so isn't that amazing? Like no one wants to have their joint replaced when they're young. Um, and I think of middle age as being young, uh, especially because I'm in that age range now too. Absolutely, I'm with you. Yeah. Um we have a question that's coming in, Cynthia, about supplements. If you're mm -hmm. fasting in the morning, what do we do about the supplement situation? Great question. So some supplements would be okay. Um, you know, things like if you were taking magnesium, if you are taking a water-soluble vitamin, like if you were to say to me, I take a B vitamin every day, that is certainly fine. Things that are not okay, branched chain amino acids, collagen peptides will break your fast fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, vitamin A um, are not good. If there's ever a question, you know, look at the ingredient list. If there are fillers like rice or there are sweeteners, you want to take that during your feeding window. However, here's the caveat, and I get asked this a lot. I take thyroid medication. It's the only medication I take. I have to take it on an empty stomach. I take it while I'm fasted. Now, if I want to dive down a rabbit hole, I'm sure there is probably, even though it's a, a more natural medication, I'm sure there's probably a filler in there, but if you are being told by a healthcare provider that you need to take a medication on an empty stomach, you get a free pass as far as I'm concerned, unless it's a like sugary antibiotic that's suspended in some type of liquid, which no adult should be taking anyway. But um, if, when in doubt, take it during your feeding window. That's always my mindset. And I would say, look at the ingredient list, you know, look to see what's there. I take my magnesium in the morning. Um, I take most of my other supplements I take as soon as I open up my feeding window and it just makes it easier. You know, the way to look at it is, you know, I've, I've seen people say that creatine is fine when you're fasted, branched chain amino acids, protein powders, collagen powders, that's completely wrong. Protein will shut off um, autophagy. So you definitely want to be mindful of that. So if somebody's getting a matcha in the morning or, you know, with uh, coconut milk or almond milk, or they're having, they're putting a splash of coconut milk and their coffee or what have you, and they feel like it's healthy, is it shutting down? Yes. It is. Yeah. So you have to have black coffee. Yeah. So it's, it's bitter tea. So green tea, black tea, uh, you know, black coffee, 
you know, there, there are people that talk about how things like MCT oil will not break your fast, but everything that I've read, I, it's about one teaspoon of MCT oil is about as much as you can get away with. And most people that are doing things like fatty coffees, here's the caveat about fatty coffees. If you're trying to lose weight, why are you consuming a two or 300 calorie coffee? <laughs> That's always, I'm, and I just said that not to be a smart ass, but I'm just like, does yeah. that make sense? That doesn't make sense. So yeah. the common sense corner. Right. Right. And so, you know, unfortunately, if you're putting coconut milk, almond milk, cow's milk, any of those things in your teas or your coffees, that will break it. I would say if you absolutely positively cannot have your coffee without creamer, then consume it during your feeding window if it's that bad. But I always say if it's that hard to do it, maybe you need a break from it anyway. You may need a break. So is there any one that shouldn't do intermittent fasting? Is there yes. Any Yes, and I always get hate mail for these, so here it goes. Um, so I usually start with those that have a, a disordered relationship with food, especially the anorexics, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating. I do, I, there's always an exception, but the average person with a disordered relationship with food, it can trigger those propensities. I see a lot of people on social media who are anorexics hiding as intermittent fasting uh, aficionados. Yeah. Um, if you are a brittle diabetic, if you are not aware of your blood sugars when they're low, so if you swing into hypoglycemia, low blood sugars, not a good strategy. I don't like it for children or uh, you know teenagers that are still growing, for the same reason that you know I wouldn't recommend it to a frail um, older person, and and that could really apply to anyone. I wouldn't have recommended it to my 80 year old grandmother. Uh, who was tiny and, and kind of frail. And at that point, I think she just ate one meal a day because that's all she was hungry for. But I think if you have chronic health issues, it's worth it to have a conversation with your healthcare provider. And by that, I mean, if you've got chronic vascular disease, if you have um, an autoimmune problem that is not stable, meaning like you were just diagnosed with Hashimoto's or Graves, you know, there is data to suggest that it can improve mitochondrial efficiency but you need to be having a discussion with your healthcare provider. So chronic health issues, um, those who have you know unstable blood sugars, uh, those that are too young or too old, and those who have disordered relationships with food. The other thing is, um, if you think that you know the mental health aspects of this are, are something that are insurmountable, like I, I've had people who've gotten profoundly depressed because they, they've believed that this is gonna be the panacea for everything and maybe it doesn't work for them and then they become mm. mildly suicidal. They're really depressed. Yeah. If you think that you're an all or nothing kind of person, probably not the right strategy. And I've, I've started to see more and more of that, that people believe it is going to be the fix all for everything. And I remind them, I'm like, if it took you this long to put that weight on, it's not gonna come off overnight. In fact, it's not sustainable if you're losing five pounds a week every week. You know, one to two pounds is really what we're aiming for. So setting realistic expectations for people is really important. That's wonderful. I totally agree with that. People are asking about, can they put anything in their coffee? Or <laughs> Salt. Here we go. Uh, uh, Turmeric, uh, ginger, cinnamon, et cetera. Are they, are great they questions. Yes. Yeah, so those are great questions. So yes, there are certain things that you can put in your coffee or your tea. Ginger is one. Um, I believe curcumin. So yes, turmeric. Uh, cinnamon also helps with insulin sensitivity. Bergamot uh, is another one. And so peak teas uh, do a really nice job with a lot of these ingredients, making teas that have some of those components. Like cinnamon is like one of my favorite things. There's actually a cinnamon tea that I love and it's very, it's not sweet. So let's be clear. These are not sweet herbs and spices that you're putting in these things. They are designed to be bitter because you do not want this cephalic phase insulin response where your body's like, oh goody, I'm getting food. <laughs> That's not what we want to have happen. Do you think that uh, if, if monk fruit and stevia and all of that, does that trigger your body to want sweets? It all, can. Even though it doesn't raise your insulin, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's interesting that you ask about stevia because we had a, <laughs> I had a, a group call this afternoon and they were saying, well, doctor, you know, Mark Sisson said, and I said, and I respect him enormously, but there's still sweeteners. There's still sweeteners on the palate. And you know, yes, there's some research to say that stevia has a negligible uh, impact on insulin levels, but I don't know if I buy it. You know, monk fruit, a thyrotol, I mean, there's it, sugar by any other name is still a sugar derivative. And so 
I just like to remind people that, you know, we want to, we want to be a clean faster, meaning we want to do it properly. And so if, if you're going from a standard American diet and, you know, the, the improvement is to have some stevia once in a while, that's fine. Or have it during your feeding window. I'm not here to be the food police, but I just like people to think about their choices. Are you using this as a crutch? Because then I don't want it to be something you use long term. I'd rather that you go a little more cold turkey or, or do this kind of in a graduated fashion so that you eventually get to the point where you're not putting things in your coffee or not putting stuff in your tea. Uh, I think that's really important. One of the questions that we have also, Cynthia, we said something about a light protein and they would like to know, can you give me an example on what a light protein would be? Yeah, fish, uh, chicken, yep, um, those are, or bone broth, you know, that's another one. I have some people who just don't tolerate a meal per se, so they'll have bone broth, which is great. Just when I say lighter, it's, it's going to be, it's not going to be like having a big sirloin steak. You know, if you have like some tuna or, you know, light white fish, like cod or haddock or something like that. And then they want to know also how many times a day should they be eating when they're able to eat during their eating window? I really like twice a day. I think at a bare minimum uh, for women, I really like them to be eating twice a day. And it could be that they eat in four hour increments, you know, maybe they eat at 12 and then they eat at six and then they close their, you know, feeding window down, um, whatever ends up working for them. But I, I find, you know, I want to make sure they're getting two solid meals and otherwise it's impossible to get that much protein in. And most, if not all of you that are watching, you're probably getting 50, maybe 60 grams in a day. And that's woefully low. That's woefully low. And it doesn't mm -hmm. accomplish getting muscle, which is what we're all striving for. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask this because you talked about this the last time we had an interview and you gave great advice. We're down, by the way, guys, to the last five minutes. If you have any questions, we're sticking to one hour. We want to put this on all platforms. The only way that we can do that effectively is to keep it an hour. So we are going to have a hard stop in about four minutes. Any advice for getting better sleep? Mm, okay. Other than the cold, dark room and blue blockers at night, which I normally would be wearing, um, but I jumped on and I realized I didn't have them on my desk. I almost called you out and said, where are your blue blockers, girl? Because I know you love them. I know. And they're, they're upstairs on my nightstand because I took them off last night. Um, and I'm, I have all these lights on in my room, so I'm sure it's definitely going to impact my sleep. Blue blockers, when it gets dusk out, you know, that helps with, um, you know, in producing the impact of blue light that, that impacts the secretion of melatonin. I think having a sleep ritual, I, I was saying to a woman today, I said, listen, just like our babies when our kids were little and we had the bath and then we had a book and then we rubbed lavender on their feet or whatever it was we did, we gave them a massage. You need the same ritual, your body. You can't go from watching TV with your spouse and eating bonbons to jumping into bed. Your body's like, whoa, wait a minute. So I, I think that's one thing. I think, you know, kind of harnessing magnesium, really thinking about adaptogenic herbs, you know, things that, yes. uh, you know, can impact cortisol and in beneficial ways. I mean, lately I've been a huge fan of Relora. That's been like my favorite new adaptogen, uh, you know, things like Sterifos, like phosphatidylserine, which we know can blunt the impact of cortisol. So in inevitably people will then find me on social media and like, what was it that you said? So the trade name is Sterifos, S-E-R-I-P-H-O-S. Um, and the adaptogen is Relora. It's not a brand. It's just, it's a derivative of Magnolia Bark. It can be very ha helpful with calming, you know, supporting sleep. Uh, I always feel like layering, you know, meaning, you know, I start really basic when I'm working with my women one-on-one -on -one and we just slowly layer things in and we find that sweet spot. And even with my husband, he's a guy, obviously, um, you know, layering in things for his sleep lately, which has been really interesting to experiment with him. But yeah, I, I would say having that sleep ritual, blue blockers, making sure that you got, um, you know, getting into bed. I wear an eye mask. I know that's like unbelievably super sexy, but the eye mask, because I'm so sensitive to light at this stage of, of my of my age, of my life. Um, I have a silk eye mask. I have a silk eye pillow. I get all into like my sleep apparatus. So. I love that. Do, are you a fan of melatonin or any of those uh, natural? Uh, I only like melatonin like as an, uh, an as needed uh, basis. I know that that tends to be controversial. There are some people who are pro melatonin. I just think intrinsically, if we're giving ourselves exogenous melatonin, the our ability to secrete melatonin can be impacted in a negative way. You know, I do have people who to tell me, they come to me and they're like, I can't sleep without it. And I said, my goal is to get you off of it. Yeah. Once a month, no big deal. 
If you need it every night, that's a problem. I mean, it, the issue is, is it, it's a Band-Aid. We don't know why you're not sleeping. And so that becomes, you know, we got to dive down the rabbit hole and do a lot of work. And I can tell you that this issue of sleep with women of a certain age is a huge problem. I think women just give up and they just say to themselves, this is my new existence. Not only have I gained a bunch of weight and I'm really unhappy, but now I can't sleep, which just makes it worse. So sleep hygiene, that's probably going to be my next book. I'm going to have to write a book on sleep. We're waiting. We're waiting, Cynthia. We'll read it. <laughs> we love your information. Uh, we're, we've got to wrap it up. Is there anything that you really want to let everyone know? Because as you know, a lot of the people that are watching and listening this evening you know, they're feeling a lot of different things mm -hmm. right now, and especially going through the quarantine and everything. Yeah. We've already talked about quarantine 15, and now it's turned into quarantine 20 and whatever. We're, we're experiencing all kinds of feelings and thoughts, and you're a thought leader, and you're a leader out there for women and women empowerment. What, what do you want everyone to know? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, wherever you are today, there's always going to be an opportunity to, to make small, subtle changes you know, if the last five months you really have like let all of your normal habits go, maybe you're not eating the way that you ideally want to be, you can start a new tomorrow. Like you can write a new chapter tomorrow. So don't feel like you've like thrown the towel in. That is never the way I want you to feel. I want you to feel empowered. I want you, I mean, you have these incredible resources, you know, Dr. Kellyanne being one of them, these incredible resources where you can, you know, connect with uh, women who want nothing but the best for you, want to be able to provide the best information, great resources. And so just don't feel like because the last five months have been tough that things can't be different going forward. And so I like much like I tell my teenage boys, listen, this is not ideal. Right now is not ideal. It's unprecedented. However, I'm looking forward. I'm not looking behind. I'm looking forward. And so I would encourage everyone to do the same, that just acknowledging that yeah, this is not ideal right now, but this is this is not the narrative for the rest of our lives. This is a, a blip and hopefully one that will will have some degree of normalcy that will be coming back sooner rather than later. But until then, you can have control over what you're doing with your body, and that's really critical. So start anew tomorrow. Uh, you know, just small, simple steps have a huge impact. I love that, Cynthia. You know, you've got sleeves up, look forward. Mm -hmm. And we know now more than ever that building that armor around us is more important mm -hmm. now than ever. That's really the best way to be protective through all everything that we're going through. Intermittent fasting is certainly one of my go to. So okay. thank you so much, Cynthia. You're I really welcome. appreciate your contribution. Please tell everyone where they can get more of you. Yep. So I have a, um, a podcast called Everyday Wellness, which I hope to bring Dr. Kelly on later this year. Yeah. Um, you can find my website, www.cynthiathurlow.com. I'm active on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I am on LinkedIn, although not very active. And there is an intermittent fasting lifestyle backslash my name on Facebook. That's a free Facebook group. We just kind of deal with intermittent fasting topics, but it's a nice place to kind of find me if you're you know, looking for resources and I have a super supportive team and they're, they're all cheerleaders just like the rest of us are. And I, I want to employ everyone to watch Cynthia's TED talk. Which <laughs> I, met her, I met her through friends and when I saw her TED talk, I knew that, you know, she was definitely someone I wanted to bring to all of you. So we are going to sign out. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And I'm leaving you tonight with all the love, all the respect to move forward to tomorrow to an even better day. So until next time, my big Italian kiss. We will see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.